Coming up with this week in computer hardware, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, we got real specs, people. The new iPad Pro and Air get magic. Some advice on choosing new audio gear and some help picking out GPUs. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Keeping passwords on notes or spreadsheets doesn't work anymore. LastPass easily keeps track and creates unique passwords for every site you visit. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. twit. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 558, recorded on March 19th, 2020. It's a console spectacular. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you all the hardware news with minimal COVID-19 coverage, because quite frankly, that's what everybody else is talking about. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by Mr. Sebastian Peake, Editor-in-Chief PC Per. Sir, have you begun to hack yet? Uh, no, if, if by hack you mean cough. <laughs> No, <laughs> I did think about that for a second. Oh my goodness! Uh, you know the nice thing about being a feral nerd, um, which counts uh, many of your hosts and the people listening to the show today, is that social distancing just feels like Tuesday, um, but with more intensity. A uh, little familial yeah. joke there. Um, <laughs> We should probably just skip straight to the hardware news. Um, bunch of Apple news this week. Bunch of console news this week. Um, you're kind of stoked about what's going on with the Xbox and the PlayStation. I think in no small part because actual details seem to be emerging. Okay, yeah. The For anybody who follows PC hardware like I do, we've been waiting for hard specs. We've seen rumors for a while about what this was going to include. We already knew that the new generation consoles from both Sony and Microsoft were going to have AMD inside, so the newest Zen 2 architecture for the CPUs, which you've already seen for desktop. And they were also going to feature the second generation of AMD's RDNA architecture. And exactly what uh, that includes, we haven't really been briefed on that yet from AMD, but it's, it's kind of nice because we're getting a preview of desktop here, starting with the Series X, which they've revealed has eight cores. So it's eight custom Zen 2 cores, they're going to be running at, it says, 3.8 gigahertz uh, or 3.6 gigahertz with SMT. Uh, this is something, I know there's been some discussion about this. We could have a separate discussion about this another time, whether or not having SMT, which is symmetrical multiprocessing, a lot of people know it as hyper-threading on the Intel side, how that impacts gaming performance. Sort of interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. Turning it off apparently can sometimes increase single uh, single threaded boost numbers, that sort of thing. But the GPU right. is what's really impressive here. Xbox is going to have, the Series X is going to have a custom RDNA 2 GPU with 12 teraflops of performance. This is based on 52 compute units, which is approaching, uh, it's it's higher than what we have at, uh, on desktop currently, first of all. <laughs> I was say, it's it's we, like a real computer, but more so. <laughs> yeah, like the the current high-end AMD graphics card since the Radeon 7 was discontinued anyway is the RX 5700 XT that has 40 compute units, if I'm not forgetting. This is significantly higher, 52. And it's apparently clocked at 1.825 gigahertz. So, and then other specs that round this out, 16 gigs of memory. That's the number we saw first with the Radeon 7 card. The board says it's going to be GDDR6 and not high bandwidth memory. And uh, mm -hmm. it's partition, which is kind of interesting. The 10 gigs are graphics, and then the remaining six are split between the operating system and other reserved memory. And then it has a one terabyte. They're describing it as a custom NVMe SSD. So uh, other specs are available from Microsoft. It, it's... It's interesting. I, I also appreciate the fact that actually both of these new consoles are going to have a, a UHD Blu-ray drive built in, which, of course, the Xbox already has. But uh, as we move on to Sony, that's something that they've added as well, finally. The, even the PS4 Pro didn't have a UHD drive, which is kind of surprising because it's a Sony product. But that's another discussion, I guess. Still, I mean, this is these are really powerful specs, and they're more powerful than anything we have on desktop right now, at least from AMD. 
12 teraflops is a lot. That's not quite up to the level of an RTX 2080 Ti, but you're getting close mm -hmm. to an RTX 2080. And we all know that consoles, they kind of get down to the metal more. They, they optimize for the hardware a little bit better than they tend to on PC. So developers are going to be able to get a lot out of this in theory. And the raw numbers <laughs> are really impressive. So obviously they're going to be targeting 4K gaming at, at good frame rates here. It would be nice if they deliver those. It's uh, it's funny you mentioned the disc on the on the Sony because that's, Robert Hare was so frustrated. PlayStation Two was such a world class PlayStation Two, PlayStation Three. Um, I said the PlayStation Three um, was such a world class Blu Ray player, and uh, oh, yeah. and and then they just walked away from it on the PlayStation Four, which he always found just uh, sad. It made him sad. <laughs> But uh, it's nice to see it coming back. I'm kind of curious how that's kind of. I'm kind of curious to see what that gets used for. Um, presumably for Blu-ray playback. I'm curious kind of what the support's going to be and and uh, if anybody's actually going to be selling games on disc. Uh, remember when games came on discs? I feel like that's a thing still. Um, yeah, and it's okay. yeah. It, they hold okay. a lot, but it's the delivery is so slow. I would love to see everybody adopt what Nintendo did with the Switch and just bring cartridges back. Right. How about slightly larger, much faster flash-based cartridges to eliminate these 80 and 100 gigabyte downloads for games? And some, depending on where you live, I don't know who this was that pointed it out. I think it was on Twitter the other day. Somebody pointed out that depending on where you live, it's actually faster to download a game than it is to just install it from an optical disc, which can be true if you live in a country that has ultra fast or if you have fiber internet. Optical drives are not known for speed. They're just really known for capacity. So True. Well, okay, so what's going on uh, what's going on, on the other side of the console fence at this point? Although technically we'd need a three-sided fence to count... Uh, Nintendo, but at this point, I think the fence that we're all really curious about is the PlayStation versus Xbox fence. That was awkward yeah. by my standards. <laughs> I mean, I, it worked for me as a transition, but really, the, the the relationship between Sony and Microsoft is they're 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 closer than they are uh, the, the last two generations. They both share a lot of the right. the same hardware, so they're they're both running on AMD platforms, custom Zen two cores, RDNA two graphics. What's interesting about the PlayStation announcement, what was really surprising and probably made Microsoft fans very happy, was that they're going with a significantly lower configuration for the GPU. It's the same architecture, but it's only 36 compute units. Uh, they're clocked higher. So it'll be interesting to see what the relationship between fewer, faster compute units versus more but slower compute units. Definitely on... The Xbox side, they're going to have an advantage with real-time ray tracing. They just have more cores uh, mm -hmm. to devote to that. And then on the PlayStation side, yeah, it's, it's clocked faster. It's, uh, let me see here. It's 2.23 gigahertz, but it's variable frequency. This is, this is what has been concerning some uh, in, since the announcement yesterday. But 10.28 teraflops is the rated... Uh, capability of this, but I believe that is at the maximum frequency. So depending on what you're doing, it could be lower than that, which would lower the actual effective performance, I think, down into the nine teraflop range. Mm -hmm. Same kind of memory interface. We're still talking 16 gigs of GDDR6 memory, lots of memory bandwidth, a custom 825 gig SSD, so not quite a terabyte. Their IO throughput uh, numbers are apparently going to be quite high. There's been speculation as to exactly what this custom SSD is, who might be making it. I know one speculated it might be custom Samsung just from the layout configuration, number of channels, that sort of thing. We'll have to see. One nice thing about the Sony design is that while not as powerful, obviously, on paper as Xbox, it seems like theirs will be easier to upgrade because off-the-shelf M.2 NVMe SSDs can be installed to upgrade it as long as they meet certain speed requirements. Which reminds mm -hmm. me of that Microsoft initiative, uh, the the flash based speed up features that just had to have a certain read write performance to be enabled in Windows. I think that was in Windows Seven era. 
I can't remember the name of that now. But because <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah, and it wasn't really that well adopted. What was that called? Anyway, uh, so yeah, it, it seems like the PlayStation 5, while a huge upgrade over the even the PS4 Pro, is is not going to be able to touch the at least the theoretical performance of the Xbox. So if you if you buy these strictly on specs, or if you're buying the same AAA games that come out on every console, and you just want the absolute best graphics, obviously we have to wait and see. But it, it seems like the Xbox will have the edge there. So it'll probably come down to like exclusive titles if there's something that there's a timed exclusive on, as it always seems to. But these are very, very close. And I, I really appreciate the fact they both have those UHD drives. Even though optical-based entertainment seems to be, sadly, already kind of obsolete. But as long as they still make the discs, I'll keep on buying them. I was going to say, I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Um, What's up with the Ryzen 9, the 4900H mobile gaming processor? Well, it's really similar to the high-end processor that already released. We heard about these Mm -hmm. 4000 series processors at CES, so it's been a while. just starting to see products either announced or hitting the market with the newest Ryzen processors. And the 4900H basically is a higher clocked 4800H. So that what's interesting about it is that they didn't increase the TDP. They have this, this little process node advantage right now at 7 nanometer that allows them to do things like this, where they, they've probably been binning these and now have the confidence, maybe the the... They call them like the the learnings on seven nanometer, whatever it is, to basically scale up clock speeds. So not only do you have a higher base clock of it's three point three gigahertz versus two point nine, but they've also increased the boost frequency by another two hundred megahertz. So the forty eight hundred H, which is a it's an eight core sixteen thread CPU. So this is a serious CPU for a laptop. It already was impressive with boosts of up to 4.2. This one just takes it a little bit higher. It's the same core count. What's interesting, though, is that they increased the graphics cores. They're still using Vega graphics with these. These have integrated graphics, uh, but they've gone from 7 to 8 cores, and they're claiming that these Vega graphics are up to 59% faster than previously, and the majority of that is from the process shrink. So these are se- these are 7 nanometer Vega graphics baked in. So they're just a, t- a little bit from performance improvements. They are able to clock it higher, but they're saying the majority of these uh, performance gains came just from shrinking it down to 7 nanometer, which have, there's, there's a lot of other things going on here I didn't get into, like the way they're measuring temperatures, and there's this new... Um, technology that they have, the way they're actually measuring boost to do bur- boost duration, uh, actual skin temperature of the laptop, et cetera. All of that's been revised and they're getting gains there as well. So they're kind of looking at the laptop as you know the way that they should really, which is it's an entire ecosystem. Mm-hmm. It's a, sm- a small form factor. It's integrated graphics. It's uh, you know maximizing boost frequencies for as long as you can while maintaining certain thermal limits and, and battery life concerns and that sort of thing. But I find all of this fascinating. I can't wait to get hands-on with a 7 nanometer laptop that's using, you know, the latest, either like the 4900H or the 4800H and see if really a mobile APU is enough for mainstream gaming at this point. Although I, I'm sure mm-hmm. a lot of these laptops that feature the high-end Ryzen parts will also be paired with high-end discrete parts. We've already seen Ryzen laptops paired with, say, an RTX 2060 right. mobile, which which is a great pairing. It's just interesting to see, you know, what not only this means for laptops, but what it will mean for the low-power, ultra-small form factor desktops that might utilize something like this and what it means for the next generation of AMD APUs as well. And I, I hope that by the time APUs hit desktop in the next generation, I would hope by the end of this year, whenever the consoles come out, that we'd be seeing RDNA 2 as well. Mm-hmm. But it, it's coming, I'm sure. But right now, it's kind of weird. Because how many years has it been since 
we've had consoles announced with higher specs than desktop graphics, which used to be kind of the norm. Arcades and yeah. home consoles had the 3D graphics. It feels like that happened hasn't happened in approximately forever. Um, yeah. Right, it just, it's well, no, but it's it's interesting, right? Because even even when the last generation of consoles were launched, it was still like this is a solid mid tier, you know. And I can't decide if they're trying to make it more compelling for PC game manufacturers, or if they're trying to give them a longer uh, life on, or you know, you know, kind of trying to start with a longer lifespan for the consoles, um, so that they can go even longer without updating them, or. You know, if it's just some weird kind of like synchronous, well, we're just going to up our game considerably kind of moment. Um, which actually almost makes sense given how much Nintendo, Nintendo has fairly modest graphics performance, um, but they have just phenomenal games on them. So maybe they feel like they need to deliver a vastly improved graphical experience and phenomenal games. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of curious to see, you know, what the games look like and you know what the relationship is between pc gaming and the and the console gaming when those ship yeah curious curious new uh, 999 macbook air some big changes uh for air first of all it starts at 256 gigabytes of ram max is out at two terabytes uh apple's claiming up to twice the performance of the previous generation of macbook airs um and this is also the first time air has offered uh quad core cpus um quote featuring the latest 10th generation intel core processors up to 1.2 gigahertz quad core i7 with turbo boost speeds up to 3.8 gigahertz which i'll give you a hint is not going to be 999 um new magic keyboards been introduced in the macbook uh, or it's basically the the magic keyboard design that was introduced in the macbook pro uh, 16 inch model uh quote a redesigned scissor mechanism delivers one millimeter of key travel for a comfortable and stable key feel while the new inverted t arrangement for the arrow keys makes them easier to find without looking down uh so two things about that one um you know we went with a standard arrow layout to really make it easier for humanity <laughs> especially humanity yeah. that moves between our model and every other laptop slash desktop on the planet uh and two uh i think the 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 900 pound elephant in that statement about the uh magic keyboard is the simple fact that we've redesigned this keyboard so hopefully it doesn't disintegrate within the first owner's lifespan or the second owner's lifespan unlike the magic keyboards or the uh uh, you know, it's uh, Apple did not come across sounding particularly honorable as an organization uh, <laughs> with the issues with their last generation of uh, keyboard problems. I just want to say that. I don't want to be cruel or anything. Um, T2 chip in there, a uh, bunch of good stuff going on. Uh, it's nice to see them give a what I feel like is a significant uh, performance bump on the Air platform. Um Apple's got a new iPad Pro, uh, which also gets a Magic Keyboard uh, with a trackpad, which is causing folks that write and tweet about Surface and iPad Pro basically to freak out. Um, there was a giant collection on Tech Meme and a giant collection of tweets and back and forths. And this is Apple capitulating. No, Surface has to look out. This is incredible. Uh, but essentially, right, Apple's going to update its iWork suite um, to add trackpad and mouse support and, uh, you know, all sorts of other useful things uh, in iPad OS 13.4. And this is good uh, because as much as people want to have a, you know, people are just obsessed with having everything being done in, um, you know, in a tactile, pokey tablet interface environment. And the reality is, is, is you have, you know, a couple generations, a couple, three generations of computer users that are used to using a trackpad or mouse. And oh, by the way, even more importantly, there are certain things that it's just easier to do for most people. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm uh, excited. Uh, I don't really have much to, you know, uh, you know, my issues with the Surface have always been less about the keyboard or the competition from the iPad Pro than it's been about some of their really miserable designs that didn't have the proper TDP to uh, let the processors actually function uh, <laughs> without overheating and slowing down. Um, so, you know, iPad Pro, uh, utterly and totally beloved by a lot of people. And, uh, 
it's always interesting to see people using them and how they use them because they they tend to be I, I tend to see them a lot in coffee shops all around the Americas. So, Apple Insider quotes uh, Loop Ventures Gene Munster and says, "Quote the lead time of four key Apple products: the 64 gigabyte iPhone 11, the 64 gigabyte iPhone 11 Pro, AirPods Pro, and the second generation AirPods, as measured across 13 countries, has significantly improved over the past two weeks." And uh, so, Loop Ventures has been tracking the availability on these various uh, Apple products since the middle of February. And essentially, the lead time dropping means that Foxconn is pumping out stuff, uh, i.e., you know, iPhones and AirPods and uh, probably a lot of laptops, given what we were just talking about. And uh, that China is getting back up to speed on production. And I'm just going to say there is life after social quarantining. And yes, there is product production after social quarantining. So if you've been waiting, and waiting and waiting and waiting for that phone to come back in stock. It probably is, or at least the you know the wait time has probably dropped significantly. Just don't try to buy it at an Apple store because they've pretty much all been shuttered outside of China. Uh, literally, I you know the the title I saw was that all of them had been shuttered outside of China. Um, what's up with fractals? The new IT ITX case that they they came out with, Sebastian. This is the era, the era ITX. It's, it, it looks absolutely <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. The one I linked to, it comes in all these different colors. The outside of the case is aluminum. It's a sculpted aluminum. At first, it looks kind of like, uh, I don't know. It, it looks like it's supposed to be a, a fashionable, like a work of art or a vase or something, the top of it. Just imagine something that has these sort of sculpted sides and a wooden top. The one I was looking at was this white oak or silver oak with silver aluminum sides. It, it looks great. And then you actually start looking through, especially if you look at the gallery, that fractal site or any of the reviews that have gone up to this point. And I think Hardware Conducts has the best one I've seen so far on YouTube. Mm -hmm. they, they compressed down. And we've seen these ultra small form factor cases before, like the N case M1 and the Dan cases mini ITX case, where they sandwich in and squeeze in full-size components into something that's barely bigger than a console or sometimes as small as a, a small shoebox. But this, unfortunately, the way they designed this, it seems like airflow was a total afterthought, which mm -hmm. if you think about something that doesn't have any ventilation on the front panel, just a few perforations on one strip of each side panel, and there's a few vents along the bottom, maybe a half an inch tall. That's it. The top is solid. The front is solid. Mm -hmm. It has one 80 millimeter exhaust fan, which apparently is not too loud. It's one of the quieter 80 millimeter fans you'll ever use. But uh, the GPU sits on the very bottom of the case with just those little uh, pla it's a plastic base. So these little plastic cutouts and uh, that's it. So if your GPU gets really hot, it's not going to get a lot of help. There's not a lot of uh, additional uh, air being drawn in from the bottom of the case. Mm -hmm. So unless you're willing to prop this up on you know, wooden blocks or raise it up further off of your desk, apparently the, the amount of space down below the GPU is not quite enough. So thermally, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, so I'm hoping for a 2.0 revision of this from Fractal because it looks fantastic. And it's it's a far less expensive case, even at, I believe it's $150. But considering mm -hmm. what the Dan Cases case, which is over 200 the N Case M1, these were limited run cases that they sell in small batches uh, through crowdfunding sites. So this is obviously Fractal's a big mainstream manufacturer. So if they're going to bring something ultra small form factor like that, I would just like uh -huh. to see them incorporate some more of the ideas. Now, in their defense, they did offer a alternate cap for this thing. You don't have to use the pretty solid wood panel. You can just put in a piece of mesh, right. which does aid with the thermals, but not really enough. It's really just the lack of air intake that makes a, a bigger GPU suffer. Not that... You should put an RTX 2080 in it, but when reviewers did, it wasn't really pretty. So, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a beautiful looking thing that 
you'd have to put a really low end system into to make it uh, work optimally. If optimally is a word, I'm you know we're going to accept. The judges will accept that. What is Excellent. optimally? Sorry, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> jeopardy in the house in the last couple of days. Uh, Mike emailed twitch at twit.tv. I find myself in need of your advice. I'd like to get a new graphics card, but I'm kind of confused about which one is the best value. I do game. Call of Duty Modern Warfare is my current obsession, LOL. I'd like to stay in the three to $400 range if possible. I'm sure you guys get a lot of mail, so if you're not able to respond, I do understand. I await your reply with bated breath, Mike. Um, excellent bated breath reference. What, yes, uh, I liked it. <laughs> do you need a whole lot of GPU to, to make... Uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare seeing on your monitor, as it were? Well, it, there's so many variables. These questions, right. it's not quite to the level of, what's the best laptop under $500? Which, it, when somebody knows <laughs> that you're into computers, it seems like that's the number right. one question it has been for years. Which graphics card to buy is a, a really popular question. And I won't get into the debate of AMD versus NVIDIA as far as driver quality goes, because I know AMD just addressed a lot of the community issues with driver stability problems recently. So just assuming that drivers are identical for a second. Right. We're just talking about cost. And he was talking the three to 400 range, which is a great range if you're interested in any kind of higher resolution gaming. And that's really what the, the issue is going to be. If you're gaming at 1080p, you can buy a great, solution for around 200 to 300 dollars and be very happy if you are using anything higher like a, an ultra wide monitor or a 1440p monitor uh you're certainly not going to get into 4k gaming in that price range unfortunately that's still just not tenable it would be great if right multi gpu had been better and was still more of a thing but right now it's the industry and Everything that's happened the last few years has gone back towards single GPUs again. And if, unless you can afford an RTX 2080 Ti, which is currently the fastest single gaming GPU, then that three to $400 range gets you really good 1440p gaming or ultra-wide gaming with fewer pixels than 4K. And even at high or, or ultra-detail settings. But in that price range... If you look at performance from different reviews, different graphics cards, current generation stuff, an RX 5700 is right around that three three hundred fifty dollar range, and it gets you really good performance at fourteen forty, or and of course ten eighty p ultimate as well. If you compare that to Nvidia at the same price range, that's where the RTX twenty sixty had been sitting. The prices have kind of dropped on that a little bit. They're closer to three hundred dollars. We're not really seeing that KO part from earlier this mm -hmm. year that was 279. That's that was kind of, you know, I won't say it was just marketing, but it's almost impossible to find. So for around 300, right. 350, it's basically RX 2060 versus, or I'm sorry, RTX 2060 versus RX 5700. Uh, if you can spend closer to that $400 range, it gets really interesting though, because you can get a 2060 Super which is almost all the way to the performance of an RTX 2070. This is where the numbers, it all gets really confusing because the 2070 was the card that was $500. And then the 2070 Super came out at $500. So the 2070s are still out there. They typically cost less money. Then the RTX 2060 is almost the performance of that original 2070. So, And that is a $399 card. So at that point, you're talking entry-level 5700 XT cards. So the way I look at it, if you can find an RTX 2070 for around $400, just get that. If you can't, get an RTX 2060 Super. If you can find a good 5700 XT for the same price, get it. And we have to be careful, though, because a lot of the cheaper ones are the blower-style cooler. They run very hot, and they get quite loud. So unless you're totally fine with that, uh, you'd probably want to save up a little bit more and buy one of the more expensive aftermarket RX 5700 XTs. It's not really an issue that NVIDIA has. It, um, it's not a bias thing. It's really just NVIDIA, even though they're on 12 nanometers still, they right. 
have GPUs that tend to run cooler. And the designs that I've gone hands-on with, and I've, I have examples from Asus and EVGA and MSI and others, and even the reference cards, the Founders Edition cards, they're all pretty quiet. We're talking cards that live in like the 35 decibel range for your average load, where blower-style coolers, which are still on the least expensive RX 5700 series cards, they're close to 50 decibels at load. So very different... Uh, thermal and noise characteristics with those. So if if you don't have a brand preference and you're just trying to get the most for your money, it's hard to argue mm-hmm. with like the 2060 Super, for example. Though, <laughs> like I said, if you can find a good deal on a 2070, it's like 5% faster. But don't spend another $100 to get 5%. There's, I, I know you'll be talking about diminishing returns, but it's the same with every industry. <laughs> the 2060 is... Yeah, the 2060 is so good that it's hard to justify spending more. On the AMD side, however, the XT version of the 5700 is significantly better. So it is worth spending more. So it really just depends on what your priorities are. I just want to say how proud I am of how good a job you've done at uh, containing the utter frustration that the incredible oversaturation of NVIDIA's GPU market. <laughs> Their stack of products at prices is right now. Yeah. Um, it's a little unhinged, to put it, uh, to, to be gracious, to be the gracious young man my mother tried to raise. Um, uh, you know, hopefully that helps, Mike. Um, you know, and uh, hopefully you're not gaming on a 4K or 8K monitor. Um <laughs> We got a, a question that uh, I was all excited about, uh, I think Sebastian too, from Leon. Not that we weren't excited about GPUs, um, but uh, we get to nerd out in a different direction for this one. Um, Leon wrote in, got a quick question. My sound system is currently a Zonar X, uh, DX sound card, a shit Magni 3 amp, and Sennheiser HD 650s. What's the weakest part of this setup? Are there any upgrades I can make that would give me a large increase in sound quality, or am I into strong levels of diminishing returns? Leon. So as a head up, uh, the Zonar DX uh, is an Asus sound card, a, uh, sort of a home theater slash audiophile sound card they make. Um, the Magni 3 is a headphone amplifier, and of course, Sennheiser HD 650s are headphones. Um, and, you know, when buying audio, like the first thing I thought of when, you know, I looked at this question is, is when buying audio, you're almost always in strong level of uh, strong levels of diminishing returns, um, especially if it's morphing somewhere in between a hobby and an addiction uh, or a passion. Um, There are some areas, headphones and subwoofers uh, strongly come to mind, that where the the products are vastly better than they were five, ten years ago. Uh, Subwoofers especially. Subwoofers, um, they're, you know... What would have been a three or four thousand dollar subwoofer ten or fifteen years ago is not a bad three hundred dollar buy off Craigslist these days. But the reality is, is you know, a, a three to five hundred dollar subwoofer, much less a thousand dollar subwoofer today, is vastly better than anything you could have bought a few years ago. Um, we're going to talk about subwoofers here, though. Um, we're talking about headphones, and especially if you start reading online reviews, um, or for that matter, reviews in magazines. Uh, Expectation bias or confirmation bias plays a huge role in uh, what a lot of folks write. And I'm a, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about professionals or people in forums. Um, people expect to hear things. They come in with certain expectations. They have certain tastes. Um, case in point, Sebastian likes um, a much more treble heavy headphone than I do. And, uh, you know, guilty, I like a guilty much more. Charged. Yeah, and it's, you know, I like a much more neutral headphone than he does. Um, you know, it, it occurred to me, and I'm not talking about Sebastian in this case, uh, a, a friend of mine had a fascinating story where he had these headphones that were excruciating in the highs. The highs were just way off the chart. They're they're blasted up too much. And a friend of his tried them on and went, these are amazing. I can really hear the cymbals. And the end result was he ended up having his friend go to an audiologist, uh, and his ear canals were basically corkscrews. Um I exaggerate a tiny bit, but essentially his ear canals were so dramatically um, curved that the only way enough treble could get through all of the sort of treble gathering nature of all of the mucous membranes or whatever it is inside your ear canal, um, that literally like these ridiculously trebled up headphones were the only ones where he'd ever actually heard a lot of the super high end of the instruments. Um, So, you know, 
individual ears vary, individual tastes vary. Um, you know, a lot of people, especially if you're into EDM, um, they like a lot of bass and a lot of treble, um, which of course makes the vocals, you know, in a singer songwriter kind of guitar thing, like say John Craigie or, or, you know, if you're into, uh, uh, I'm hearing his voice, but I can't think of his name. Um, you know, insert name of whatever your favorite, you know, person with a piano or a guitar that sings is, um, in any case, you know, a lot of confirmation bias. I bought this $300 cable and it's really opened up the soundstage on my speakers. It's magnificent. Um, a lot of that's, uh, you know, confirmation bias where it's like, this sounds amazing because I've already spent a lot of money on it and integrated it into my system. A lot of that it has a funny habit of disappearing when you blind A-B test things uh, at matched levels. Um, you know, one of the things that, that people do when they're testing, if they're super, 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 super critical, they will make sure that, that two different things are matched so that they are, you know, are pretty much at the same exact volume as measured in dB. Because it turns out the way your brain processes audio, if you listen to two practically identical speakers, if one of them is a little louder than the other, you'll be like, the louder one is better. Um, and it's just a consistent thing that happens uh, when scientists look at how people pick what audio they like. Um, so all of that aside, which is to say the best thing you can do um, when reading a review of a new thing, you know, whether it's, you know, super cool audiophile magazine or Bob on, uh, you know, Headfi or something is to always try to get a chance to listen to it for yourself. And, and the can jam events, or there's some amazing audio stores out there. Uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to, to be in LA, um, the source AV has one of the most amazing collections of headphones and headphone amps and DACs of probably any store in the United States. Um, there's a couple of good ones in Denver in the Northeast, um, or you can purchase from a place that, that gives you a trial window or, you know, doesn't punish you for the return. Um, and you also need to listen to things. If you can listen to it for an extended period of time, because especially if you're shifting between headphones, when you go from headphone A to headphone B, um, your brain will first go, oh my God, this is all wrong. And then over the course of 15 or 20 minutes, it kind of recalibrates itself and you'll have a, a more true kind of response to what the headphone actually sounds like. Um, you know, and I, I talk about headphones a lot because the vast majority of what you actually hear uh, has a lot less to do with the DAC and the headphone amp than it does with the headphone itself. Um, so those HC600s, uh, HC650s that you have, um, they're classics. They're one of the headphones that kind of redefined the headphone market uh, a while ago. Um, they're neutral, they're clean, they have a very pure presentation, there's no extra bass, there's no extra high-end sparkle. Um, they're open back, that you know gave them a really big sound stage. Uh, it's only in the last few years that closed back headphones had the same kind of sound stage and presentation as open back and it's not always true, but it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, you know, if you want to try another headphone, AudioQuest Nighthawk might be a good one for you. It's super neutral. It is extremely good. It's one of my favorite headphones. And, you know, it started out at like $600. And the original uh, sort of wood tone uh, one, I think, is under $300 now if you want to experiment with something. There are some ridiculously good planar magnetic headphones, which instead of a sort of speaker or dynamic headphone, uh, uses a plate of some kind of polymer that has traces on it, and they suspend that polymer with the traces on it between two magnets, and then they send the voltage from your headphone amp through the traces on the polymer, and this big panel moves back and forth to create the air pressure that hits your earbuds. Um, Monoprice is 555C is alarmingly good for 200 bucks it's sealed back it's got big wood cups it's a little heavy um but the performance is astonishingly good for the money um it's you know i, I have some you know five-year-old planar magnetics that cost twice as much maybe i bought them used for twice as much uh knew they were probably three times as much and i'd say the the 565c is a vastly better uh can um but it has the advantage again of the technology getting better as time moves forward. Um, you know, your headphone amp's probably fine. Uh, they are a, they, they're, they're a fairly difficult load to push. Um, they're a, you know, they, they have a fairly high ohm measurement. Um, you could try, 
JDS Labs Atom, it'll measure cleaner than the amp you have. It's $99. It outperforms a lot of amplifiers that cost three or four or five or six or seven times as much, especially some of the really expensive older amplifiers. Um, you know, the crew, I know the guys at JDS Labs. Uh, they're great people. Um, and the, the principal engineer there basically sat down for a year and experimented until he came up with this astonishingly good amplifier. And it does an amazing job of rejecting background noise. You know, I had a... $1,500 set of speakers that was picking up all of the noise from uh, my 34-inch monitor, and then I shoved the atom of it into the monitor. Nothing. Completely total rejection of RF. The you know, channel... Uh, are very evenly matched, i.e. when the volume knob turns, you don't have one earbud or earphone uh, you know, level going higher than the other. It's a black hole when you pause music. Um, you know, um, if you don't hear noise when you pause your music, if you don't hear uh, distortion as you turn the volume up to your favorite listening level, your, your headphone amplifier is probably just fine. You know, um, if you do hear noise in it and it's not coming from your DAC, um, you know, then that's when I would really say it's time to get a new headphone. Or, you know, if you turn the volume up and it distorts, uh, A, make sure you're not playing too loud and blowing your eardrums out. B, uh, that might be time to get a new headphone amplifier. Or, you know, if you have, if you plug your headphones into your phone or your headphones in your computer output and you can't turn it up loud enough, um, it could be an issue with not having enough amplification for the headphones you have. Um, I've never listened to that uh, Asus Zone RDX sound card. Um, Aces has done some really good stuff. Uh, when people drag out the high-end testing equipment, they often don't measure as well in the real world as they do in the specs that are listed from Aces. Um, Audio Science Review has done a bunch of good work on uh, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, generally speaking, um, properly implemented DACs should sound more alike than different. And DACs are one of those areas where there's a lot of magic fairy pixie dust. I mean, I could point you yeah. towards a $19,000 DAC that, you know, if you want to get a software upgrade for it because there's a new audio format, they'll charge you a good hefty $700 for that software. You know, great for them, charge what the market will bear. But again, there's some fantastic DACs for a hundred bucks or a few hundred bucks. And quite frankly, the DAC inside your laptop, your desktop is probably pretty good. Not as good as it could be, but much better than it would have been a few years ago. Um, I really like the current generation of AKM DACs. They're a Japanese manufacturer. Um, they refer to like their velvet sound, which is mostly marketing, um, but they're extremely good and they don't have any kind of glitches in the response curve that some of the others do. Um, I've also, you know, like one of my favorite ones I've heard in the last two or three years is I Fi's micro IDSD black label, uh, which makes it sound like a bottle of scotch, um, but it's using Burr Brown DAX and it sounds amazing uh, and it tests really well too. So you know, um, you know, before you start buying stuff, like identify a problem, identify which component is creating that problem, and then try to fix it. And if you can, only change one thing at a time because if you start changing multiple things at once. Um, you never really know what fixed what, but, uh, I might try an external DAC, um, you know, uh, just to see how that compares to the Zonar. If there's, there's a weak spot, it's probably the Zonar, no offense to, to Asus. Um, but, uh, you know, some of their cards I think have done better than others at rejecting noise from the motherboard. And from what I've read from some of the testing out there, uh, some motherboards create more, uh, interference issues with the onboard sound cards than others. So that's probably way too much information for everybody other than Leon, but <laughs> hopefully that gives everybody something to think about. <laughs> you know, I was thinking while you were talking about the fact that maybe he is not actually experiencing any significant issue. It's just that it's right. a hobby. This is something where once you get into high-end audio or, or you're obsessed with the quality, it's like, I... <laughs> I want to make it better. I want to get a new DAC. Yeah. Uh, what about the the headphones? Is, are the headphones good enough? And really, it's probably just fine and would yeah. be fine for the rest of his life. I, my own example is about 10 years ago, I was first getting into higher quality audio and stuff. I'd been kind of an enthusiast, but never really had the money to spend on it. And mm -hmm. I bought at a significant discount this integrated amplifier from Yamaha, a really good one, a AS500. And then... I found nice. a used pair of Boston Acoustics A26 bookshelf speakers. And this pairing 
sounded fantastic. I'm like, this sounds so good. I can't believe I got all this for like 400 bucks. How good would it be if I could spend a thousand dollars in the amplifier and buy like $1,200 speakers? And then I, I had unfortunately the discretionary income and was not married at the time to start blowing at all on loudspeakers. And I went for a couple of years basically of just buying one set of tower speakers, and then another, and then selling one off at a huge loss and buying another and buying different amplifiers. And in the end, I finally just got my Yamaha amplifier back out, picked up another set of those speakers. and like, you know what? This is good enough for casual listening. I downsized almost everything. I, I still have the Magnapans right. I bought through all of this and a really high-powered amplifier to drive them. But I don't really have the space to set them up. Those are Magnaplaner speakers that have to be almost in the right. middle of your room. So my little modest listening setup went all the way back 10 years to the, <laughs> the one that worked for me the first time. Especially, yeah. this is what happens when you have a kid, by the way. It's like, I don't want thousands of dollars in stuff where he's going to knock it over, which he did. So, cheaper, One of our everything. kids yeah. hammered his uh, Matchbox car against the aluminum driver of, of my Elax, which uh, uh, had to have a talk with his parents about, you know, what what that actually meant financially. <laughs> um and, yeah, uh, it's, but it's, I mean, here's the thing, right? Um, if there's an audio place near you, if you can go to audio shows, um, get a chance to listen to stuff. Um, and you know, one of the things I, I think Sebastian just made abundantly clear, but let me hammer it home with a, with a, you know, eight pound sledge in case it wasn't, is that, you know, music tends to sound really good on anything, right? You know, Bob Marley, Kirby Hancock, you know, is going to sound amazing on a crappy AM radio uh, in the middle of central Nevada. Uh, and yeah, it's going to sound better on a decent FM stereo and it's going to sound better on vinyl and it's going to sound better than that on CD and it's going to sound better with better speakers. Um, but mostly if you're there to listen to the music, um, you know, find something you like and stick with it for a while. And I wouldn't upgrade until you try something out and go, oh my goodness, this is a thousand times better. Um, but be careful because that thousand times better for a certain part of the audio community is something they find like every 10 days to six weeks. Um, yeah. And a lot of and times it's thing, not that much better. <laughs> another thing is that if you already have a setup going, because the yeah. whole the whole chain matters. If you already have a setup yeah. going that sounds good, but you want it to be better, beware because altering one component suddenly maybe an amplifier that's a little bit thinner that was paired with right. speakers or headphones that had more bass, so it sounded really balanced. You bring in a pair of headphones that are kind of treble heavy in with an amplifier right. that already was a little thinner sounding. Suddenly it sounds really bright, and you may not like that. The the I little speaker say, setup I was talking about was, sorry, it, it's no, just... No, no. Heavier no, no, bass I, I, speakers go well with amplifiers that don't have a lot of bass, yeah. but they don't go well with speakers that don't have a lot of bass. It just well, the, it's a the very thing is though. At this day and age, your amplifier should be a flat line from ten hertz to above audible frequencies, and if your amplifier impacts the treble or the bass on your speakers. Um, it should only be doing that because your previous amplifier was underpowered for the drivers. Or because your previous amplifier should be taken out back like old Yeller and shot. Because <laughs> it's you know that's a good point. There are, and, and cheaper, no, cheaper no, amplifiers don't have the 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 oomph for for yeah. really uh, inefficient speakers. That's another subject, the yeah. speaker sensitivity thing. But yeah, well, you also, I mean, to put this into context, the Magna Planars that that Sebastian mentioned earlier, if they're the model I think they are, they are six feet high, they are like three feet wide, they are two or three inches thick, uh, and if you can place them, pro if you have a big enough room to place them properly, um, you know, and you don't need, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, punching your thorax through the back of your spinal cord kind of bass um, that we associate with certain kinds of music, they are alarmingly close to you know the proverbial real thing it's a, it's a it's a spectacular experience um it kind of terrifying something i remember the first time i heard a pair it was just like oh, 
it's like we're in the room. <laughs> like, um, and then they're like, except, and guess how much the amplifier cost that we're driving these with? And you're like, oh, no. I think it was worth approximately eight times what the car I was driving at that point cost. Yeah, um, yeah. But now, but that's the thing, though, now is, is right. Is you can go to companies like Emotiva, for example, or some of those entry-level Yamaha amps. You know, if you need 50 to 100 watts per channel, which is more than enough for the vast majority of people and the vast majority of speakers, you can get a phenomenal, solid-performing amp for 200 bucks or less if you can find it used. Um, which is great as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then you can kind of build from there. But, you know, double underline what Sebastian said. Change one component at a time because um, <laughs> everything works together uh, to give you the audio you want. any case, that was crazy. Um, goodness, I think we've run out of questions and stories. That's frightening. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I will very briefly mention that we didn't get to was it's related to the consoles kind of, but DirectX 12 Ultimate was announced today. Microsoft, really? uh, their uh, conference, I can't remember the name of it right now. They they moved it to an online event, so that's mm -hmm. going on right now. But DirectX 12 Ultimate kind of brings a lot of those features that are going to be on the next-gen consoles to desktop. So all of the the built-in ray tracing support, the DXR 1.1, a lot of the advanced features that are going to be featured in those next-gen consoles that are not hardware dependent, they they'll work on Nvidia, they'll work on AMD. I presume they'll work on Intel when Intel has discrete GPUs available. But uh, that's official. Uh, it's very technical. Some of the stuff is easier to understand uh, if you're interested. Microsoft is doing their DirectX Developer Day right now. Where they're streaming it live on Mixer, so anybody can just go and, and be a part of this. But a lot of advanced technologies are coming, and it's just it's going to be built in. It was kind of interesting they're not calling this a new version of DirectX. It's not 12.1 or 13. It's just Ultimate. So like Windows Ultimate back in the Windows 7 era, DirectX 12 Ultimate. And I believe it's just going to require a certain build of Windows 10 or higher, so it's Windows 10 20 H1 update. Uh, that's actually, let's see, today. Oh, I see. So they're supported today with that update. So we will see hmm. what games. There was no list of games or anything, game engines that are going to be taking advantage of this, but I, I'm pretty sure that news is all going to come. This was all stuff that was going to be part of GDC, and of course GDC was canceled as a in-person event like everything else has been. And then NVIDIA even pushed back their announcements. So uh, this is it's kind of trickling out. So Microsoft, they're doing their thing today. AMD and NVIDIA had their own separate announcements about this as well. It's a big deal for AMD graphics as well because uh, NVIDIA already had real-time ray tracing with RTX. And mm -hmm. RTX has a lot of the same functionality. The, NVIDIA talks about how they're still going to have the best solution, of course, uh, this is their position. AMD is excited because they're getting real-time ray tracing. So the next Navi GPUs, we hope, big Navi, whenever this comes out, RDNA 2 architecture has built-in support for this. I didn't see anything about them kind of backporting it to RDNA. It would kind of be like what NVIDIA did to bring RTX features to the GTX cards, which was allocate a certain amount of the shaders to just do dedicated hardware ray tracing work which is mm -hmm. less efficient than using an RTX card so I, I, I imagine when we see those bigger Navi GPUs with higher uh, streaming processor counts they'll be able to do something like that but it'll be interesting I mean this year at some point I hope we'll see introduction of big Navi which would be the mythical AMD Radeon 5000 series graphics card that has either up to or even more than the compute units that we saw with the previous generation where they were at 60 and 64 CUs. So like 4096 streaming processors where currently we're stuck at, well, before this console announcement, we were stuck at, uh, I believe, 40. So if they're up to 52 CUs on console, we would hope we'd see another 60 or 64 CU desktop part, which would... It should be tremendous uh, performance 
making 4K gaming like a legitimate possibility at 60 frames per second. So we shall right. see. We wait, ladies and gentlemen, with the proverbial bated breath. If you've got a question for us, do us for your email, twitch at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv because we want to answer your questions, especially if you're sitting at home contemplating what you can actually get through Amazon Prime by now. A, uh, a uh, note of uh, thanks to the mobile carriers that are offering extended bandwidth, or I should say extended uh, uh data caps um it's been interesting to watch right uh you know i think Fortnite. somebody was it was crazy like i think Fortnite play was up something like 70 percent in italy uh or i'm misinterpreting the quote that says sort of online gameplay uh, but uh the general bump i'm hearing from uh you know europe is that uh bandwidth is up 30 percent and there was like an eu request for netflix to only stream at uh sd uh uh, at SD rates and, and Netflix has agreed to sort of like reduce the amount of bandwidth because so many people are locked in at home and streaming video right now. Um, you know, that's uh, kind of a wild thing to think about because that's a lot of data. <laughs> 30% bump is a huge increase in bandwidth. So, hey, practice your social distancing, wash your hands lots, take care of yourself, and we'll see you next week. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peake. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>